které? Které? Great, uh, we have your attention. So, um, welcome to the uh, very, very exciting discussion on navigating next generation technologies for culture. My name is Ten Salover. I'm the moderator for um, the next uh, 90 minutes um, or so. And uh, before we start, speci specifically, would like to thank uh, Norden, uh, Nordic Council of Ministers, uh, who has put together this, um, I hope, very um, exciting and uh, hopefully a little bit uh, controversial uh, <laughs> and uh, active debate um, on uh, next generation technologies uh, for culture. So how we're basically planning to structure this conversation is that we will have about 10 minutes uh, for each um, panelist today to uh, talk about themselves, their exciting work that relates to technologies and culture. Um, um, and then we'll kind of throw it up for a discussion and the Q&A. We have the ball there, the blue ball, Xenia, you see in front of you. Oh, so I've, I'm already, Xenia, tasking you to uh, throw to the first uh, throw of the ball. So how the ball works is that if you do have a question um, or if you want to attack us, as one of my professors in the university said, uh, to have a debate, then raise your hand and then uh, we're going to throw the ball. Uh, please make sure that you will be talking not to the sign, but to the microphone uh, on top of the ball, because we are also going live um, at Telia. Um, and then um, let's throw the ball around and um, have, uh, hopefully, a great uh, discussion. Well, to kind of uh, start with, we definitely know that uh, technology is changing uh, culture. Uh, it's a bit of a... Uh, you know, common truth, um, but we see that especially during the time of COVID um, and, and so forth, we have seen a tremendous acceleration. Whatever types of numbers you're looking at, the numbers towards digital and, tra and digital transformation that also is uh, touching culture and creativity and all walks of our life, um, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, according to some estimates, we've sort of leapfrogged about seven years, seven to ten years into the future. If, for example, if you look at TikTok, which more or less defines itself uh, not anymore as a social media platform, but more as an information and communication platform, TikTok is having about more than half a billion users uh, every month uh, signing up to the platform. I can't really know the exact number. I, I forgot the exact number, but it was about 25 to 30 percent of residents in UK are getting their news and the most of the information uh, from the platform. Um, you know, talk about YouTube or any other bigger platforms in there where the amounts of content spends are in billions. Um, digital is coming and it's already very much interacting with our cultures where of course we can talk about banana pictures and monkeys, pun intended, the NFTs which are um, coming into this space very actively and of course uh, many of you have probably already heard about the M word or the metaverse which uh, is also a very very big um, big buzzword um, if we talk about fashion, connectivity, collaboration and so forth. So all of those topics, how it's influencing artists, fashion designers, gallerists, uh, investors, uh, researchers and so forth, we'll be talking uh, in the next uh, hour and 20 minutes or so. So our panelists today are Xenia Yost. Xenia is a fashion designer, mixed media artist, and she focuses on sustainable upcycled and digital fashion. She's also very much hydrating us <laughs> through the Haga brand. Um, well, make sure to drink water, it's awfully hot. <laughs> um, but after graduating a degree in fashion from Estonian Academy of Arts, she has worked with Vivian Westwood Fashion House in London before returning to Estonia, having a small stint in Vietnam as, um, as well. Um, and she, besides establishing her eponymous fashion line, and she also exhibits frequently and right now works uh, in the intersection of digital fashion uh, and sustainability. And about those topics, we're going to definitely talk with Sin as well. Ervin Laiho, uh, trying to pronounce names uh, correctly, is an artist in residence at the Forti Lab in Arto University in Finland and founder of Studio IOR. And his work focuses relationships between land and tangible um, communities. And uh, the content he creates is influenced by research about the creation of goods and services um, and also tokenized uh, forms of expression. And uh, Irvin also has a ledger 
with him. Yeah, today. I have a ledger as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm a hardware guy in a way through and through. Um, so even in NFTs, always thinking about what is it actually made of. What are and those? So Irvin took uh, the blockchain with him today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have the keys. He, he has the keys. Yeah. He, he has the. Uh, Hova Tveito is an Norwegian architect and creative director working in technology, art, and architecture. Uh, he specialized in virtual reality in, at the Interactive Architecture Lab at the Barlett School uh, in London. He has worked with studios such as Marshmallow, um, as artists and engineers, and several um, VR installations. But he's also a founder of one of the first NFT galleries uh, in Scandinavia. So we'll be talking about how NFT curation uh, is uh, taking making waves. Uh, and the name of the gallery is Nifrost. Uh, so it's fully digital. Google it. Um, and then we have two Indrex. Indra Kibrus is a professor of media innovation at the Baltic Film uh, and Media School at Tallinn University. He holds a PhD from London School of Economics and Political Science. Um, and his ongoing uh, research projects, uh, projects are fo focusing on value creation in creative and cultural industries um, around open data, blockchain, uh, and so forth. Uh, Indra and his colleagues are also authors of the um, Estonian Digital Manifesto. I'm trying to find it. I have it. <laughs> I'll show it to you later. Uh, it's a great book. Um, highly recommended to read it. Um, um, and we're also involved in several uh, research projects. And finally, Indrek Kosela is an Estonian angel investor, gallerist, and the, also the owner of Estonian's premium art house cinema, Cyprus, together with the distribution arm. And he has invested into several very interesting startups in the intersection of tech um, and digital and culture, including Digital Sputnik, which is one of the premium lead lighting manufacturing, um, yeah, lead light crater in the world. Mm -hmm. And um, straight out of here in Estonia, but their technology has been featured on Mandalorian, uh, massive productions, and so forth. Besides, he also is the co-founder of the Temniko and Kosala Gallery, which did the first big NFT drop with uh, uh, Tommy Cash and Katja Novitsko. <coughs> All right, so let's get going. Uh, Indrak Ibrus, I want to start with you. So um, <coughs> when you you've been researching, let's say the larger paradigm shift um, yeah, between traditional or established cultural industries and um, and the new wave. Um, what exactly are those big paradigm shifts? We see those spikes all around, but in your manifesto, you quite very much defined what this new reality, what we're already experiencing right now is about. All right. Uh, thank you, Sam. Do, typically, I'm doing this kind of uh, one and a half hour lecture about these kinds of things uh, to uh, the students. Let's start. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, we wrote that manifesto so uh, almost one and a half years ago, with the purpose that we based on an understanding that um, that in Estonian context, the digital culture, the emerging digital art forms tended to be, in terms of policy-wise, kind of nobody's business. Because Ministry of Culture was kind of, in a way, stuck with their own traditional regulating and organizing the existing uh, fields of culture and arts, uh, and uh, everything digital was uh, kind of supposed to be to the domain of Ministry of Economic Affairs and Communications, and for them, the whole uh, everything culture and arts was just mm -hmm. soft, uh, blah, 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 and then they really didn't care much about this, this if he, if he sometimes went to them and tried to discuss the, the potentials of, of, of digital art and how this in, in many ways uh, yeah, is driving the economy. So this is why we did it. And the argument, you know, I'm going to cut, of course, the early histories of the internet here today, but I think um, uh, I'm actually agreeing very much, or the potential is there at least, um, an Estonian guy, uh, Mario Laul, uh, who is little known in Estonian, but uh, but who works for investment banks in the U.S. context, and who argues that we are probably on the threshold of something called kind of the new, the golden age of the internet, where all the kind of troubles, humankind, societies have learned to know all the kind of risks and troubles, and have learned to regulate those things, and especially now with the arrival of the blockchain. Uh, technology, etc. We are probably the, we are ready to develop ways 
where the wealth that is created in a digital economy could be potentially um, distributed more equally based on actual kind of uh, to those who actually create value, because the, but the problem is that sort of the, the, or the challenge has been that in the so to speak Web 2 era, the, what came with it was the so to speak datafication process, where we mm. a lot of data has been collected about us, and this has been used for all kinds of monetization methods, and uh, this has also brought about that wealth has been generally extracted by those big platforms and not really often reaching the actual creators who, who are yeah sort of actual value creators and and then the sort of the blockchain based infrastructures could uh, enable these ways of we are aware how better aware because blockchains are um, not only participatory, not permissionless, so that everybody can, can participate, but also uh, hardly uh, transparent. We know how value is being created. We can develop ways how to uh, reward the actual creators better. And as you mentioned, that I'm not, I am a research guy, you know, a boring academic. But what but, but I've uh, noticed in my research, what we are working on is that we are kind of studying right now the, so to speak, YouTube alternatives that are emerging um, uh, blockchain based and um, and we see that this is uh, of course you know, there's all lots of kind of crap out there as well all kinds of conspire conspiracies con conspiracy theories uh, emerging and uh, flourishing on the in these environments but at the same time th these environments are also valued by the participants there because uh, because they they are there's no platforms that takes all the wealth but it reaches the participants value creators better and this is this is exciting right now uh, and of course, yeah, everything else, uh, probably what we're going to discuss today is the, the continuing datafication process and, and the plat what to do with the platforms and I guess in Estonian context this is what we need to deal as, as So the manifesto ended up <coughs> with if uh, Sten and I and multiple other people uh, were part of uh, Minister of Culture organized, uh, we, we created something new called Estonia's Digital Culture Strategy, was it? And so at least we are kind of on the threshold of this right now on this new potential avenue of policy making, uh, pushing more, more towards institutions and more systematic activity of, 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 of yeah, Caring more about digital culture, new forms in Estonia. In, in Estonia. So, if um, let's go a little bit. Uh, we, we're going to come back into the decision-making process as well. And I think you very rightfully said that we are a little bit living in a two parallel universes. Uh, in in kinds of sense that we have a lot of established structures that are um, that are carrying on. We are very fam familiar with them. Even in culture and creative business, we have forms of authority. Uh, based on seniority or expertise and so forth, and then there is the whole other world uh, for everyone um, under rough generalization under 25, um, where um, it's, it's a world about participatory creation, it's about uh, collaboration, it's about, as you said, the different types of value, uh, value creation, uh, value creation at all. Um, in which, um, I mean, why, let's say, we have seen so less um, adoption of those that new digital world into our mainstream uh, mainstream culture, and why are those uh, key sort of let's say strategies or elements or topics what decision makers have to keep their eye on to get a get on boat? Yeah, that's for okay. You. <laughs> um, yeah, no. <laughs> I don't want to whine here, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Of your, cultural policy is slow, and maybe it's a good thing because, we, of course, it often needs to be about preserving what we have. And uh, I, as a kind of cultural theorist, you know, all innovation and culture is somehow based and related to the old, uh, and this combination of the old. So, of course, we need to. Uh, be based on on everything that is already that is already existing, and uh, in some sense, it's also been re reasonable that uh, most of the digital culture initiatives, uh, Estonia and more or less everywhere else as well, has been first taking care of digitization of of, of, of heritage, yeah, of our existing analog archives, and then related the the next question is how can we then still open those 
um, enormous repositories for re all kinds of remix practices, reuse practices, uh, etc. So that uh, whatever is innovating, whatever is new, is meaningfully connected to the old, and we can kind of as as citizens, as participants, we can continue building of uh, our identities in a way, our knowledge uh, spheres uh, in relation to what's, what's already existing uh, around us. It's, there's a lot of value in there. But of course, um, so very, very often it's about uh, certain path dependencies, inertias in uh, government structures. As I said, uh, in Estonian context, uh, the digital culture has been kind of no man's uh, land for a very long or time. Or a bastard uh, child, kind of. Yeah, yeah, bastard child, because it's we are we are used to think about that. Oh, we are in Estonia, we are all kind of very kind of forward thinking in, in in terms of digital, but in the culture sphere, this has really not been the not really not been the case actually. Um, and perhaps and uh, in terms of economic theory, my me myself, I'm an in institutionalist. We need proper institutions to really push. Uh, thing going and and somebody who takes responsibility and kind of in, takes care that good initiatives are being invested into, uh, good initiatives are being pushed. And of course, then the next question is what is good? Yeah, what is really valuable in the culture? We, do we need all kinds of video games to be uh, yeah around us? And of course, it is an interesting question, and this is something we can discuss. But but the reality is, uh, uh, as you said at the very beginning, that. Um, I don't know. I have two kids. They are playing Roblox and uh, Minecraft and all kind of foresight, 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 uh, all the time and other things. So uh, obviously, uh, and they are watching now it's Apex Legends and now. all kinds of these things. So obviously, we need to be aware. Yeah, we need to be. This this needs to be good stuff, not not just. Uh, uh, we need to be. We need to take care that we have a cool, cool, meaningful that adds meaning, that is relevant to our environment. To the games that, uh, in some ways, are helpful in terms of younger generations growing into bigger ones. Bigger ones, yeah. So, in this sense, um, uh, we need to take care that the, the that arts and culture around us are of good quality, are meaningful, are improving are participatory. our meaning spheres around us, are participatory. But participatory is also paradoxical, because participatory can bring about all kinds of bad things as well, uh, yeah, f f problematic uh, media, content production, etc., etc. So there's there are hard questions there: how to regulate that participatory environment so that it produces quality stuff that are meaningful and enables growth instead of disarray. Yeah. So la last quick question: uh, in the past year, you've been working quite a lot with open data, and if we can perhaps say that correct me if I'm wrong, uh, is that in many ways the big difference is that we're moving from a kind of authority based or, or political authority or artistic excellence based author authority based model into a, let's say, data based model where um, legendary saying, um, uh, you know, we would like to believe in God, but everybody else would bring data. So um, so in, uh, in many ways, you also work with public broadcasters, for example, which are considered to be the, the sort of the earth um, of here in the region as well. What kind of interesting things you found out from working with open data? What, uh, what did this, can you no, actually, talk about uh, Let me correct you. I'm not, I'm working with data that should be open. <laughs> that is not open yet. And I'm, for instance, I'm working with, right, yes, as you mentioned, with the ERR, which is Estonia's public, Estonia's public broadcaster. So they do have, um, of course, a lot of content, but they have a lot of metadata about their actions, uh, what they do as well. And so, um, in some sense, if we would publish the data they have, in a systematic manner, everything they do in terms of improving the public sphere in Estonia could be more visible in terms of um, in terms of understanding how value is being created in the public sphere. Our research goal right now is to understand when ERR or other public service broadcasters are collaborating with independent content providers, 
how really is good content? Well, good content is a, is a theoretically problematic concept anyway, but this is why we are tra what we are trying to define using the big data analytics that what era really adds variety to the public sphere, who has been created it, then who, how did they collaborate in arriving the, at arriving these kind of interesting, innovative, diverse form of, forms of content, so that if we have this data and we can publish it openly and widely so that everybody can analyze how a certain public sphere really works, then uh, then we can maybe in invest more, uh, direct more of, fun more of funds towards those that who do great value and uh, and to the initiatives that bring about value. So, um, so in this sense, uh, the whole aim of of open data, obviously, it's just great, increase the transparency in the society and eventually in this way facilitate that those who are actual value creators are rewarded and more and uh, and and uh, are more so uh, included into into cultural production processes than perhaps has been the case. Because especially when cultural creators, when they are also interacting with not to VRR but Netflix, etc., you know the complaint is that there is so much so much of untransparency. Yeah? The bargaining power of real artists are very very limited because nobody knows the data. So if you could uh, again arrive. At regulations that this kind of data needs to be published again, we could over time arrive at more kind of fair, um, uh, more uh, fair, yeah, value uh, wealth distribution systems methods. And this is not just about fairness; it's also it's a long-term um, process that uh, because those people, those creators, then can continue their business successfully for a long time. And and this is all about sustainability, really, about the public sphere and cultural domains. Thank you. So the key takeaway, if you are running an organization, be open um, and uh, release data. Indrak um, Kosala, uh, well, you're ho holding kind of s sorts of several three seemingly opposing chairs. You're an investor investing in uh, digital products and services. You're running a very, very great and classic art house cinema and an art um, gallery as well. What do you have seen transforming in the past uh, to two or three years um, from those ventures that you're managing? Well, actually, well, the history goes back not two to three, but 20 to 30. I was just, uh, <laughs> thinking in a way like... Um, so, um, uh, of uh, yeah, the first sort of contacts with the digital art, I was just thinking in a way, was back uh, when I had my first computer. But they... Back in 1980 something, and uh, little obviously it's like with a cave. There's very little to do, so people start sort of doodling. Then you know comes canvas. Uh, you know can't really eat it, so you just start painting on it. And then comes a computer. You can, at the time we were only able to play like teddies, and, and then we obviously started doodling as well. So I, I find it very nostalgic seeing the current um, current sort of an NFTs uh, and where they are. So in the in the, in the teenage years, but uh, like it, they're not actually opposing. And as I said, I was a jack of all trade, so uh, it's sometimes you fall between the chairs. Well, actually, you fall between the chairs quite often. But uh, actually, that classical art house theatre would not exist without the uh, digitization, mm -hmm. because uh, what is the, if we, let's let's start to uh, try to structure them. The answer. So, if you go in a film, for example, so you have two aspects, both on production and, and the distribution side. So, obviously, in production, digital arrived much earlier, cameras, etc., so it brought down the cost, which meant the studio systems went really there to work. And we saw that the same thing in a in music, where uh, well, they finally they managed to get a hold hold of the um, of the culture again. Uh, those institutions uh, like record companies and live nations, etc. But um, obviously, when we were running it, the, uh, we actually start, started to have like our own first streaming almost before Netflix had it. Because Art House Theatre has been around for a long, long, long time. Because back then, you had to physically transport the raw film rolls, which meant that a lot of the stuff uh, was never ever shown, uh, none of the stuff was ever like produced. Uh, so um, uh, it's um, you know it, I think this uh, the new stuff helps to keep the old sort of experiences alive. The question now is the third aspect is the viewing uh, experience, yes. where we've seen a massive sort of a change there. Uh, there's a lot of positives in the sense. Of what I like well, there's the difference between those sort of like in formats is that they're all curated, unlike uh, the big evil social media, and I think that's where the 
where, where the real problem there is. I also happen to sit for uh, sat uh, for eight years on the board of the biggest media company, traditional media company, and which we turned into a digital media company. Um, it doesn't matter what the format is, as long as the content is, um, and we're still living in a very human-centric culture, sort of an sphere, uh, is, um, uh, is, is understandable. So there was always a big fear that what if we don't do traditional newspapers, does the digital woman have to be something completely new or uh, or uh, not a copy, but like have, it, have its roots and, and, uh, in, the, in the traditional media. So they, they have to understand that the one piece of the equation has changed the slowest, and that's the human being. Whatever we want to think, we are being the, the, the cog in the wheel, in a way. So there's a lot of technology that can help that, but also, like, you know, our cognitive part is, is still, um, has, um, you know, and it's a 32 bit level, so that I, would, I would say. Uh, but you know there are ways. I'm not going to get into that. That's too too fringe. She's talking about <laughs> using hallucinogenics to like expand the mind, etc., which will happen as well. But uh, yeah, the the the, the that cinema would not expect. So the street, the viewing is uh, is I don't I'm not um, very negative about. I think my thing is that there's, the more people get exposure to the culture, the better. The question is then comes like what type of culture. Uh, we and I, I'm I'm not don't really like operate in the in today's world, but as I said, like you know the um, whatever we see institutions, the formats, etc. is very human centric. Uh, would the AI create its own culture, and how does that affect? And I think that is the the, the very big thing that we should think about. So um, and, uh, and what we're seeing now, I think, is this. Is uh, in in a, in a physical world in a, in its like classical and very sort of an epic example is really the battle between the kinetic world, which is happening in Ukraine, which probably will be one of the last massive kinetic wars. Uh, hopefully, we will survive, and then and then the future is basically where you you know it's an, more like in a movie experience where the human lives any longer no longer will be sort of expandable. So I think that there's a lot of things happening at the moment. So we, we don't like you know uh, the and the old institutions are trying to harness and to make sense of it as well. Uh, but what you said, I don't actually see that my bigger problem. I always think that things happen in the fringes, but it's a culture and technology. Like, you know, Finland is a fringe country, but you guys, like, you know, invented mobile phone and created the best <laughs> best uh, mobile games. So, uh, and then once it becomes something, then all these institutions come in and try to make sense of it. And obviously, you know, the problem with, uh, with, the, with the existing institutions is that, you know, it. Uh, uh, recognized artists are always recognized, no matter what format they are. I mean, like, you know, Leon Dormick does sculpture, film, video, whatever, like, you know. The problem comes when some kid, random kid comes and does something, and because then, you know, I said, we are, I said this is the, the human centric sort of views. Like, so who's that suddenly now? But uh, in music, I mean, like, the Minister of Culture has never created a music, and has never created anything, in a sense. So I think uh, all those institutions will have to be, and will either die or be redefined and so you can't stop that or hopefully uh, that migrate flow. into metaverse <laughs> uh, well, whatever like I'm most most likely i mean we you know we're so old we we still remember the second life and uh, there's been a few other attempts uh, as well but it's not like in it's just like you know it's uh, um, it's like you know building a mobile phone with the uh, world's biggest and best lasting uh, battery which nokia did and failed and, and the other guy said oh fuck the battery like let's make it a nice you know and that's now the apple iphone <laughs> so you know <laughs> All right, but let's talk about fringe kids. Uh, Tommy Cash um, and Temnikova Kasela is a very well known and very well represented gallery. Um, Venice Biennale, you have an um, amazing uh, roster of um, artists working with you. Can you a little bit tell about the motivations and the, the drive of making that NFT project with Katia and uh, Tommy Cash? Well, I, I guess I said, you know, the um, was what we've seen in Valley. So great things happen when, you know, you know, there's sort of a, what I call a club kids uh, meet. So the engineers and um, and artists. Um, so uh, that's uh, because they're both in in in, in creation. Uh, so. Um, 
And it, it was obvious that we will evolve into something uh, like that. And I think what is particularly interesting about the so it's uh, density block called mutagen was that um, maybe we can also have a picture while Stindrek is talking. Um, yeah, but then it's an um, uh, so uh, so that. that it, it was it was very confusing for the established artists in a way because you know they were like you know what's the big fuss about this thing, uh, and I compare that we are like in a in the teenage years of the NFTs where it's more closer to collecting uh, like baseball cards or digital stamps and that's fine when the volume is very important. Is remember like in a teenager you were very passionate, like you thought your your love was the biggest in the world and you were like amassing these things. I, I used to collect stamps and stuff like that as well, you know. But then you have this one thing that's just like you remember, and then eventually you throw everything away, and then you know you move on to the on to the, uh, onto the other things. So um, it was just uh, uh, and it's why I think it was it was similar in a sense. It was was trying to actually converge the sort of you know digital native with artists that already have some uh, some sort of a reputation. But those are all artists who had, as I said, in re in real life, they don't matter what format they are. So they already had worked in, in digital format. So we got the best uh, best developers together, uh, best guys together. Actually, uh, that's a bit of an industry secret. But Tommy had the hardest time in a way, although you would think. But um, and he's, he's, he's very visual. Had a very uh, important show in Cornwall with the National Art Museum, etc. But in a way, in the process, he had the hardest time in a way to kind of um, and, um Get himself digital, which is which is uh, strange in a way. But that's I think what happens. Real artists they take time to get into them. Anyway, uh, so uh, it went super well. <laughs> uh, Everett made tons of money, which is uh, you know one thing that I think I think what the, why people are paying so much attention to it is really the money. Uh, I think cyberpunks are there to stay. I think apes are going to go because they don't <laughs> really have artistic value. <laughs> and I think this is what we uh, would. Uh, and but I, I'm a strong believer that this baseball baseball card collections will eventually morph into something because what it does it provides the finally the the platform. So we we used to be very big in selling video art. And traditionally, how video art is sold is that we make a DVD, you know, we put it in a nice box, seal it, and then we issue a paper certificate and sign it. And say, like, do not show it to anybody. Like, you know, just this is yours privately now. And I give you an example. So, like, you know, which I, I had, um, so uh, this one DVD can cost tens and tens and tens of, uh, thousands of, of, um, of euros. And the real problem was uh, is that, was that uh, I mean, you know, there are people with very extensive video collections uh, is that, but you want to also like have it to show it to the public, but still kind of retain the fact that you can still own it. So there's a very big technological thing. It's the same what happened in cinema. That finally, everybody can can access and not to worry about. So that's the biggest thing. It man. There is no such thing as NFT art yet. I mean, there, like I said, there's a bunch of kids doodling around. Some of that will, will become very uh, very big. But uh, it was like uh, making the uh, getting. You know, getting the the canvas. You know, the obviously people will forge and do that. So, uh, and we will be doing a next drop very soon. So stay 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 <laughs> tuned. Hopefully, it goes as well as well. But it's it's a multi-year project now, and and I think um, it's um, and again, I don't think the old uh, old institutions can. Uh, can kind of control that. So whether the Christies or others. So um, let's see. Very very cool. Thank you. Um, Xenia, well, how how are you then doodling around with uh, NFTs? <laughs> um, look, fashion industry has been, you know, historically so much obsessed with the with the value of uh, producing something exclusive um, and physical, um, and you've been also been involved in a very high line of fashion. Um, how how did your transformation into the uh, digital world uh, came about, and why? Yes, it is so true that uh, fashion actually it's uh, very like uh, trendy and it always tries to be ahead of time, isn't it so? But not in digital space at all. I don't know what's happened with us, but this is this is the truth. So uh, in fashion, there hasn't been so much digital movements at all in the production side, in the in the art side, in whatever side you look at it, and uh, huge, huge uh, sustainability issues, as we know. Uh, so there is a lot of ways how to approach it. The digital uh, 
aspects in the fashion. First is from the production. So if we look how much we can gain with the collaboration of uh, digital and, and manufacturing, we can reduce a lot of um, costs, a lot of overproduction, so on, so on. So this is actually already happening. So it's not that something that will happen. This is how a lot of fashion houses and fashion brands are working nowadays. So that means that the first sampling is done digitally. Uh, and you can see how it will look on the human. And uh, then you decide, do you want to produce, produce it or not? And you don't need to do so many samples anymore. So when it started, then um, a lot of creative people started uh, playing around with this technology. And um, happened something, something really interesting kind of two, three years ago when it stepped out from the manufacturing part and started to be independent. So uh, the, the digital fashion items uh, were created without any uh, aim to be produced or to be physical. Uh, the first one was sold um, by fabricant uh, three years ago now, two years ago, it was $9,000. So it was an item that was only online. It, was, it wasn't NFT. Uh, it was just a file. Uh, and so from there, a lot of bus, a lot of uh, creative people started to play around. And today we do have uh, a lot of really great startups who are uh, doing only digital clothes. They don't want to be in the manufacturing at all. So we do have those who are still in the, man not still, in the same time, let's say so. So they still work and in the same time work with the, digit uh, with the manufacturing. Then we do have those who are creating only digital and uh, of course uh, when all this uh, NFT thing started and there is a lot of those who are creating NFT art from the uh, from the digital fashion and uh, me myself I tried um, first time it was this autumn it was first uh, metaverse fashion week uh, in the decentraland so it was really really a lot of fun to to create a wearable that means the item that could be uh, worn by your digital avatar so uh, maybe a bit scary to to none, no, none, uh, it's not that all of us having uh, digital avatars, but please believe me, we do. So okay, if so you do question, <laughs> who of the audience has a digital avatar? One, two, three. Oh, oh. Uh, but fashion too. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe uh, I explain a little bit wider than the, what I mean. But hey, let's talk about an identity and identity, uh, identity exactly. image and digital yeah, avatar. Yeah, well, exactly. uh, another question: Who has an Instagram account? So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our image that we do have on the on the web that we create ourselves. So it doesn't really matter do we create it professionally or we are professional Instagrammers or we just do it for our family like a closed account. Mm -hmm. So still we do create it. We still do choose what we put there. So this is our image. And we do have our image in the physical world and we do have our image on the web. So probably all of us have something. <laughs> so, and next step it is uh, if you do create a so-called avatar in the metaverse, so it's like a figure that you can dress and so on. Uh, maybe it's more easier to explain via the gaming. So if you, if you play the game, you probably will have uh, somebody running around and you can dress this person. So there is uh, a lot of artists who are dressing up those, uh, those avatars as well. And uh, so a lot of really fun things are going on. They're not uh, so much established today, so we see that there is a different uh, ways to go with this. But uh, I truly believe that a lot of great things will happen soon, and we'll see more of this, you know, like different ways and different uh, designers or artists choosing different ways of, of, of participating in this. So, so I'm just going to... Uh, oh, sorry, this is the metaverse fashion, the first uh, metaverse fashion week you see here, and the participant here, of course, the the pink one the, down is is my design, but we have a Dolce Gabbana here, and you know a lot of a lot of great designers and and fashion houses, and what uh, what is really great about it is that uh, you can really participate with the 
with the big players on the same stage because there is still so much free space to the creators. So it's and we're all basically on the same start. Yes, time. and we are all we are all experimenting. There is nobody who can really tell you that this is the way you should do it because nobody knows. So and when you start a project like this, then you gather like people around you who are doing with you the same project. So we are all in very different level and you know all together we just create it so this is this is amazing if just I quickly intervene here uh, what is also quite fun because personally I'm not really uh, exploring the VR worlds but uh, augmented reality experimenting and so instead of just going wearing the goggles and or w w exploring the Metaverse via some sort of bigger screen, but you know, walking on the streets, yeah. So we could, uh, in maybe five years or maybe less, so we could all sit here and we we wear some sort of augmented reality glasses, and each one has a great, great dress that you normally wouldn't dare to <laughs> wear, and we can all explore each other. And these experiments are already real, you know. So people are building these things. So this is a, again, again that we are moving as hybrid space with uh, uh, with. Yeah. different kinds of outfits, not really perhaps only the clothes, but you know, facial features and etc, etc. So lots so, of fun is happening. And things are happening pretty fast. I just recently looked up and uh, in about 2004 there was an article uh, in one of the biggest Estonian newspapers that, voila, in central Tallinn we have 10 Wi-Fi hotspots. Olympia Hotel was one of the places where you could access this magical thing called Wi-Fi. <laughs> and uh, in many ways, you know, mid-2000s is not that long time ago, right? So, so everything what we're talking about somehow is coming much more faster uh, than uh, we would like to believe. And definitely it's not only the domain of gamers. Re recent research also shows that especially during the pandemic, everybody plays. Um, uh, including seniors, middle-aged people, and so forth. So those things, those collaborative, semi-virtual places, uh, are becoming our lives, um, parts of our lives, um, increasing, increasingly. Meanwhile, if you don't have a digital avatar, I'll do a little bit of blatant advertising. There is an Estonian startup called Ready Player Me. You take a photo of yourself, um, put it on, and in about 10 seconds, you will have a perfectly fine digital avatar of yourself. It's totally it's really amazing. <laughs> Um, Xenia, I really, the last question uh, I wanted to really ask about is um, the connection of digital and sustainability you, you talked about. Quite often, I, I'd say in a classical, even in culture, there seems to be a sort of a mental opposition that digital definitely equals servers and waste and electricity and so forth and so forth. And sustainability is something that needs to be very much down to earth, green and so forth. Um, you've been working on the sides of both. You a little bit talked about manufacturing. Manufacturing, but but where is like your work going about? Not so long time ago, I think last autumn you told me a, little, a few shocking numbers about Estonia and uh, Kotzen, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Shock the audience, please. Uh, <laughs> so the, the my best move is this: that uh, if uh, today we stop manufacturing the clothes like all over the world, then we still have six years new clothes to buy from the shop and to wear. So this is the situation that we are today and it's growing. So it's not that it's, it's reducing itself somehow, now it's growing. So the situation is really bad and what we are doing, so I can talk actually, actually about fashion sustainability for one more two hours. Okay, two minutes. Uh, yeah, two minutes, I have. So cool. uh, about, uh, about the di digitalization, so the, the truth is that a lot of us are buying clothes, not because like all of us guys, it's not because there's nothing to wear in the in the cupboard it's kind of we need two pairs of trousers one we wash and one we wear that's it so above this what you're buying it's not it's not anymore about what to wear or that you don't have clothes, so it's more emotional. And this is where digital fashion can help out. So for example, today what we are doing already is that if you are having an Instagram account and you want to wear something fancy, or maybe not fancy, whatever, something different, you don't need to buy it from the shop if you do it only for the photo. So you can actually buy a digital dress, digital pants, digital sweatshirt, and you, you can have it on, on your Instagram account or, or you know, maybe 
maybe on the photo, what I'm doing today is that I'm doing a... Or on your Zoom call. Zoom the... call, yeah. Uh, what I'm doing project with a um, creative incubator in, in Tartu that they want to have um, their staff wearing my digital shirt, so on the, on the web page. So that means that you don't need to produce to have a photo of your staff on the company uh, site. Yeah, no more bad swag. So, yes, you actually can have it like a digital way and you can create like, you know, all kinds of things. It could look very real, like this shirt, for example, or it could be something, you know, moving around or whatever. So, uh, and Instagrammers, the influencer, are using it already. I have had a maternity shoot with one lady who wanted, so if there wouldn't be a digital fashion, she would, you know, buy some clothes from the shop only for one photo shoot. Same for the fashion magazines. And so we have a lot of, online on the Facebook, we have this um, uh, marketplace where you can buy things. And there's all, all the time I read that uh, I, 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 it was for only one time for the photo shoot. Come on, like for the photo shoot. So this is actually the sustainability issue that we are already solving there. And of course the production part. Great. Uh, let's do a quiz now. We've been talking about quite a bit of metaverse. Uh, we have the Votemo platform here. Um, can we get the Votemo QR codes? Yeah, so on the Votemo platform, we have a little quiz for you, uh, or a poll. So, uh, so the poll is very simple. The uh, question is this, are you ready to implement digital Web3 technologies such as NFTs, blockchain, or metaverse into your professional or private area of practice? So, uh, let's see. Let's give a minute for, for people to, uh, to answer. Ooh, I had some uh, prejudices because I thought that most of people will say, no, it's too complicated. <laughs> well, actually, we see that 77% uh, of people want to learn more. So, uh, wow, that's, uh, that's great. And about 8% people are ready to do that as well. We'll continue the conversation. You still have a time to vote if you have any other questions to uh, both online or um, or here on site, uh, microphone, and vote in my chat as well. But Erwin, I want to turn to you. Um, well, uh, let's start with, you've been engaged quite a lot with um, NFTs. And uh, in our little pre preparation attack session, <laughs> We went uh, to dis discuss really, really the question of like what exactly are NFTs, and your argument was that perhaps those are not banana pictures, um, but it's something more and something more extended, a form yeah. of culture. Yeah. So just to elaborate on yes. how I see NFTs yeah. currently, and what's your excitement in there? What's my excitement? Um, so initially, my excitement was that there was a form of the art world that was functioning and active even though the actual physical trad art world was largely um, like uh, in inactive because of the pandemic right um, and I found some corners of web 3 on alternative blockchains where it felt very kind of like um, so, sort of like a rundown neighborhood, this is Tezos blockchain, for example, which was developed for a purpose which was never realized. And uh, in in sort of like uh, second quarter of 2021, when the NFT boom started uh, really catching a mainstream appeal, so did this like uh, ghost chain develop into a art artsy, punky sort of neighborhood where prices were next to nothing and people weren't expecting to sell anything. They were just tinkering around with the blockchain. And that's actually my first work, which is a video piece referencing the sort of underlying logic of just, well, binary logic of computers and then drawing parallels to how we've kind of like perceived digitally, digital media in past. But yeah, the the fact that there was a active and like sort of just a burgeoning sort of area where there's a lot of exchanges between artists, not about what they're worth or, or speculating on the value at all, but gallery artists who are represented by real trad art galleries trying to think through what's what's the most uh, reasonable, uh, native, kind of like essential way of using this uh, distribution format. And um, 
well, art made a natural uh, kind of like uh, first or, or first comer to the NFT field because art has so few um, performance requirements. Uh, nobody's uh, looking for art to do something with it. It's enough that it exists and it has intrinsic value, which is not related to how it exists in relation to other stuff. Um, so, so these. Uh, what started as pictures of them become, in my work, uh, 3D models and interactive things, not because I want you to use them, but because if we're using the digital media, I might as well make things that you wouldn't be able to own otherwise, which is uh, not only pictures, but, but like uh, something you can uh, ro roam around in and turn around and, and kind of like, have some interaction with that you would have with some of the work that I've done uh, previously, which is sculpture. And I still still continue in the vein of sculpture. There in the photo, you can see kind of the two, two sides of my practice where my, in my sculptures, I cut up things that are computers. And then in the digital realm, I'm thinking about the materiality of the technology in a, in a different way. They're sort of like uh, mirror images of each other. Um, now, as for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Indrek, I'm going to have to reference your your job at uh, NFTs. Not not to go into attack mode or anything, but okay. the, the, fact, the <laughs> fact that um, the fact that these things are called NFT art in the first place, I think, is a travesty. Most of NFTs have nothing to do with art. They're not contributing or thoughtfully uh, positioned in relation to art, and that's fine. I'm not saying they're worse. It's just that they aren't art in the sense that we usually use the term, or certainly on this the panel we would. If you're a parent, and everything your kid makes is an art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a bit <laughs> like that. It's very simple. <laughs> yeah. Well, for a creator, this is a definitely an art. But yeah, well, they, well, well there's an, a value in it. That's, you know, that's another part of it. You know. In the case of like the apes, for example, the fact that they have that's bad art. art. That's, yeah. that's ownership part where where they actually who owns it is more important than what the work actually. Yeah, it, it has and social capital. And that leads capital. us to auction mm. auction houses as well. Oh, the it used to be Russian yeah. oligarchs. In NFTs, they were like you know rappers. So this is. A, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so yeah, the apes kind of took off, and um, they, they are like perfect uh, sort of zenith of this. Uh, the social capital version of the NFT world where you are chasing uh, kind of prestige related to what you own. Uh, so it's like a, it's basically a, a flex, um, but it's a natively digital flex. So it's not you taking a picture of your car and putting it online or you taking a video or maybe you can take a 360 video of your car, but it's never really going to come across what you own, what, what that awesome thing that's expensive, what, what, what it is. To your followers, if you if you post an NFT that's expensive that you appreciate, and maybe they will as well, um, there is a, an immediacy, a directness, a nativity of communication. Nothing is lost in translation because nothing is being uh, transported. It's it's there, and you see it for what it is. Um, so so this like sort of uh, flex culture we are kind of reeling from, I think. The pendulum swung so hard uh, into that direction with the speculative NFT price bubble that, uh, yeah, now we're here talking about apes. You know, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> yeah, and how fast this went into a lingo, public lingo, right? Yeah, yeah, that too as well, yeah. Um, but then what I'm really excited for, um, I'm really excited about creators being able to make their own art and it being appreciated for uh, what it is in and of itself. Uh, a lot of uh, 3D artists, uh, a lot of uh, creative uh, digital workers have only been able to uh, make money off of applying their craft to uh, commercial content basically or working in uh, adjacent industries. So, I mean, I had a discussion with an engineer and he was like, I don't understand what the fuss is about NFTs. And I told him, yeah, that's because you haven't spent the last 10 years learning how to 3D model as well as, you, as anybody else, you know? So like his, his skill set just doesn't have like a natural avenue of being realized in that world. But if, if you had that capital and it's all the time being thought, oh, you can replicate that forever. Why would anybody pay anything for that? And now we have digital scarcity digital signatures, um, ledger technology that 
proves that what you have is the real deal, uh, and, and that gives its value. Show us your ledger. Show us the ledger. <laughs> yeah, so since, since, since I'm a hardware guy, I have my keys with me. So this thing here is a so-called cold wallet, and this is my keys to my decentralized uh, storage. So even if I lose this, even if this breaks, I will still get in using my um, passphrase, but, or a seed phrase it would technically be called. But I'm a self-custodial maxi, as one would say, and I think this is going to be the kind of ultimate battleground of Web3, whether people can own their own tokens, uh, or if it's going to be so that we need to host them on exchanges, which is basically the model that we're subjugated to right now with uh, banks. Um, but with this, the stuff I have uh, behind this key, nobody else has this access is, this to. Is, this is the cold storage for your my, unique... Yeah, so this is one of my like six wallets, and this is the one I least uh, often access. Th that stuff's just sitting there. It's for my gran grandkids or something. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Uh, look, one of the topics that we also discussed was that there is a quant the peak paradigm climatic change around participation and communities for both the worst and, and the good. So in many ways we were talking about the way how this, this new digital space is very much community driven, but it also has its limitations. Yeah. But at the same time in many ways it also frees or democratizes the way how the decision making process in the world is happening. Yeah, I think uh, Professor Ibrus's point about uh, decentralization and then the consequences that we don't like to think of, that if anybody can upload any content onto a uh, not curated, not uh, safeguarded uh, permaweb, then, you know, the, that, that's a sort of nightmarish scenario if you think about the sort of worst of uh, content that you could upload. Um, and, and this is like a really uh, touchy tension that we all want decentralization, we all want so that we can all own a piece of the big thing and be owners of our own content and not ask for permissions but uh, do it as like, like sort of like a um, utopian public space that we all, all have a share of and nobody, uh, there's no gatekeepers. But then when the auction houses uh, decide to sell a few NFTs, then suddenly we're really excited about gatekeepers. The, the, so, so, so we don't want anyone looking after, but then, and because we're, we're in charge, this is our space, and then we don't want to try the art world, we don't want the middle, when, middle men to get involved. And then, yeah, the auction house thing. So in the art world, usually if stuff ends up at auction, it presents a, a possible problem. Uh, that can be a risk, and you'd rather the things were exchanged because of death, divorce, or taxes through the gallery instead of going to auction, because then it's for everyone to see, and art world likes to be opaque. Um, and then uh, people got really excited because they didn't know that that's actually sort of the vultures of the art world. And they said, oh, this is institutional uh, legitimiz legitimization, this is uh, now the big boys club. But it's, it's really not that those people will sell anything, uh, so the auction houses that is. Uh, so we, we're yet to see uh, Pace Gallery uh, launched a platform. I think they're the kind of biggest, one of the mega galleries that have done <coughs> things with it. And um, the, then we have trailblazers like uh, Howard and uh, yeah. Drake over here. I think that's a very good cue to, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to Howard. Yeah, these guys are gatekeepers in the positive sense, right? They have taste, they have experience, and, and they're really looking out for culture and the people who create it. And in, and in many ways, the potential of this technology, which is not good, bad, but neutral, not either, is, is really for us to make Howard. Well, you originally started as an architect, but new, you're really now work focusing on new digital forms of creation. So what's your kind of venue in building the first Scandinavian digital art gallery, Nifrost? 
No, I think uh, you know my interest in, in this comes in from from you know I, I, I was a trained architect, but went into to uh, uh, digital art and worked with VR uh, for quite some time. And what interested me is that um, the possibilities of, of digital spaces. You know, often tend to think of spaces, social spaces, as an architect. Um, um, uh, what's what's interesting is that you know it was touched upon earlier in the debate, but I think we're not going to continue uh, walking around in our in the world like this, looking at our smartphone. You know, we are going to be surrounded more and more by digital sp spaces, digital overlays, um, information, but also means of expression. You know, they might come through a pair of smart glasses. They might be in a VR space, more in the sort of maybe a more recreational setting and a more uh, professional setting. But I think, um, as it was said as well, you know, the, the the humans, we as humans, remain in our senses, our, our cultural baggage. So they remain uh, there, but it's possible to also alter this and alter the way that we see our environment um, through these new set of senses. You know, we, could, we can make the invisible visible uh, in many ways, or give uh, give ourselves uh, a different set of senses and you know, always new means of expression. I think that's very important. We are living more and more in spaces that are uh, they are digital, but they are also maybe. Um, we um, can think of them as neutral, but we also see that they often come from they come from Silicon Valley. They might come from the U.S. or from maybe from London. They they come from some of these tech hubs, and we often uh, see them just as as a product that we consume, something that we we. Uh, uh, have no part in sort of changing. Uh, we feel a bit powerless in sort of changing them. So it's important to see that we can actually open up these spaces. And I think, you know, artists like uh, Advin is, is very interested in sort of working directly with this sort of, uh, you know, how can we hack these these uh, technologies or how can we sort of take them down on this sort of pedestal in a way. Uh, so getting to my point is like, we are still going to want to surround ourselves with beautiful things, things that are thought-provoking, that might, you know, even piss someone off, you know. We want to make a statement or discuss. So how do we do this, that in these often very sort of sterile spaces? We are surrounded by a lot of spaces that, uh, you know... Where the politics are quite often invisible. Yes, uh, they, they are. Uh, um, and they often... You know, it can lead to very disturbing things as we see in a sort of web 2.0 in, in, in social media where this can be hijacked. We use, you know, our sense of um, rage or, or our sense of things that are important to us. Um, but but it's, I think it's very important that we do, we are still going to want to, to make our mark. We're going to want to make art, to, to, to uh, also to see art, and so we, you know, starting up with Ni Fost, um, uh, one of the, the key parts was to see like NFTs starting to starting to boom up. We start to get uh, digital arts has already sort of been around. Was the next thing, you know, after video art, installation art, you know, it's, it suddenly all of a sudden got uh, the attention and was was seen as something that you actually could could invest in and buy and it was a platform there for you to actually purchase this and uh, and and also what we see is a second hand, hand market that starts to open up which makes it very interesting obviously there has been a boom of, of you know this just the quick cash grabs and everything people just want a piece of their cake don't care about the, the cultural value of it but but uh, it also has grabbed the attention as, as giving given some authority to digital artists um, so tell a little bit about practicalities. How do you select, how do you curate, and a big question for many artists as making those five copies of hand-signed DVDs in the box, authenticity. <laughs> how are you practically addressing those challenges? Uh, that is, it's a very interesting thing. I think, you know, we've been, we've been um, so um, I'm here with my uh, co-founder here today, Pedro Hag Foss. Right. Uh, so we've been working uh, working together on, on this and seeing sort of um, NFTs came as a possibility to sort of, you know, uh, 
to be a platform that could be better than the DVDs, you know, because video artists always struggle with this. How do you sell it? You know, do you sell it with the screen or is it just DVD? How do you, ex you know, how to exhibit this? Uh, I think what's interesting, what we're going to see in the future is also that we are uh, going to be able to invite people over into our digital uh, living room or our digital private gallery where we will be in the AR setting or VR setting now, the metaverse is sort of, exp you know, come as, it might actually be a better term than all these abbreviations, that it is going to be a social space and that's what we wanted to do with the gallery is to have, actually have a social space. It's not just a place where you view a flat version of the NFT, it's a place where you can come, you can meet the artist through an avatar. Um, you can discuss and, and uh, view the art uh, together in a social space, in a gallery setting, but it might be that you purchase an NFT and you might invite friends over to view it in your personal space, in your in your living room, so to speak, but it actually, might actually be more interesting in the future than in your physical space. You know, today a lot of, if you talk about the big fish, you might have your art in a storage space uh, somewhere where it's, you know, sits between the national borders, you know, you might never show it to anyone, you know, you own it, it's an asset, but it does... It's in a Norwegian harbor, as in Christopher Nolan's film, yes. a.k.a. A. A. Kumu. <laughs> comes to, uh, comes to, uh, comes to mind, you know, they, they sits in these sort of uh, hidden spaces, but if you could invite your friends over from Estonia, from Tokyo, from, from from the US over, you know, uh, if the time differences allow it, and you can, you know, sit uh, and enjoy the art together and have a discussion, you know, that then it's all of a sudden, it's an added value. That's something that's very important for us to, to give an added value. And also this, the, so we sort of jumped on two things at the same time, uh, coming sort of from a VR background, and very much wanted to take this into it, that it's not just something that in the flat space. So very quickly, how do you how do you do your curatorial principles? Hmm. What is exhibited at Nifrost, and how do you make your decisions? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, getting back to your uh, question, I think we wanted to have a uh, Scandinavian sort of approach to it because there's two there's kind of two things. There's the uh, NFT scene which exists in Norway, both from artists and people who buy NFTs, but they don't necessarily buy Scandinavian artists. They might buy the the American ones or the, whatever is, is around, uh, but there's also, you know, obviously a, a scene of Scandinavian art collectors that collect Scandinavian, Scandinavian artists, but they in general collect the more established artists. How do we get these two sort of worlds to merge? That's sort of our, you know, a bit of a long-term challenge because it's a bit of a challenge to bring these two the physical and sort of the digital together in some way. But it's also two, my two different age groups. So we want to put um, artists together. We might ex exhibit uh, artists from outside of Scandinavia, but we want to put them together with Scandinavian artists. So the first big exhibitions, we sort of focus on some of the, the, the sort of really the big fish. Uh, we had works from from Beeple, Grimes, and so on, put yes. together with the Norwegian uh, uh, art uh, collective called Trash Benny. So sort of wanted to put these together and see what happens, you know. And what happened? <laughs> I think it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting thing. I think a lot of people started to realize there is actually something happening in Scandinavia. It's not just the really, the really big ones out there that, um, and it forces you to, 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 to think about it in a different way, you know. So here's, here's a tip for the gallerists, big ones, local ones, and make things happen. <laughs> Possibly, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, we have now time questions for the audience. We have already uh, one for Xenia. Um, what could possibly go wrong with fashion being created and used in the metaverse? What possibly could go wrong? Everything. Wow, everything. Nothing, guys. <laughs> nothing. It's creativity. Nothing. What could, what could go wrong? Like the worst thing with fashion. Okay. In physical fashion, I see a lot of the sustainability issues, but it's uh, if you just look at, at the creative part, it's nothing. It's ex ex experimenting all the way, and this is what creativity is. So we do experiment, we do some mistakes, but you can't really call it that. So it's like, you know, it's a play, so nothing. We, I don't know, I, I can't see. Maybe I'm too optimistic here. Index. <laughs> Well, I'm an academic, so my job is to <laughs> think about risks. Put me back on the ground. <laughs> to think about risks and see all the trouble. So, um, 
So in the online sphere in, in general, as we all know, the problem is that very often our realities are different. Algorithms are either feeding us different kinds of news mm -hmm. or we ourselves, because of our cultural preferences, are seeking out different kinds of stuff. And so we increasingly, this is why the danger is that the, 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 our knowledge spheres are quite fragmented, etc. We don't really know what each other we do know, etc. So uh, when it comes to that topic, something we have been discussing in the academic context is that what if um, uh, these, uh, in the, let's say, augmented reality sphere, you present yourself differently for different kinds of people. So Stan sees your fashion differently as I am, etc. So the question is, should we start regulating that? If but where is the how problem? We perceive, <laughs> I can't say problem here. Um, so. No, the problem is that we, our, our realities get so different that we don't even yeah. perceive our realities around us the same. Uh, we, I, I may communicate a sign here that oh, this is all bullshit what you're saying, <laughs> without you even being aware. So basically, all traditional uh, strange questions. So I get, police, why is the question comes? Should this be? Should, should this be? Uh, this space regulated very hard? <coughs> it's always the same. I kind of even do that because obviously technologies are different, etc. They may show us, present us in realities different, etc. As I said, my job is to <laughs> <laughs> be the troublemaking guy and ask the strange questions. So just on the digital identities, uh, Gotten Diedenberg, who is, I think she's also doing a session today, or she yeah, was they, doing uh, So in four o'clock somewhere in the city, metaverse becomes the topic. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So but Gotten has uh, <laughs> just recently written an excellent book, Section, Sex and Social Media, which really talks about uh, identities as well. It's really fun read. Um, I highly recommend to um, check it out. So uh, nothing but can't... Sorry, nothing I want can't to ask more. But what is the difference about the physical world, you can do like you know, it, it's a problem in the physical world. It could be. It depends on the on the people around you, how you know they behave and trust it. In I'm not saying that there is a um, definitely a problem, yeah, but yeah. There, there could be that we really perceive our surroundings really differently from each other based on whatever settings we have either applied ourselves sure. or others have applied. Yeah. And then the question is, yeah, it is a question if this kind of potential perceived reality fragmentation is a mm -hmm. problem. Can it, can it, can, I, I can't imagine mm -hmm. problematic scenarios when this is why the, yeah, the question is there. Hold uh, I think it's interesting because it translates like there's kind of two points mm -hmm. I might try to make, but one is, is that you see, um, uh, we saw it, like, or I got kind of, uh, um, had a, a big, or uh, was go almost scared when when seeing uh, what was happening when um, Meta first launched. There's a range of of, uh, me uh, of metaverses, uh, horizons being one of them, uh, and w there were questions that were raised then, or things that happened. Uh, yes. Unfortunately, that happened that we never thought about when arranging our gallery because we catered to like a smaller uh, group. We left the gallery sort of open for people to come in and visit, uh, more or less kind of unattended. But when seeing when a lot of people come in at the same time, as in uh, when when Meta or Facebook or have their uh, concerts, for instance, in in the, the metaverse, everyone is just chucked into a lobby and you're suddenly all of a sudden there, and you have all different age groups uh, there together that poses uh, problems. You're all, everyone's freely moving around, talking to each other. But also a person that, that um, uh, reported to have been sort of virtually abused or assaulted. And that was a big case, you know, like, is always that even possible? Some people might ask, but there's a lot of studies that show that the way we uh, perceive digital spaces or virtual spaces are exactly the same as in real spaces. Mm -hmm. Our, uh, our um, modern brain will know that I'm not here, but if you try it in VR ever and you lift it up, for instance, and you have fewer heights, our sort of Stone Age brains will get freaked out. Mm -hmm. And also the, the social space becomes sort of affected by this. So th there's this sort of, there's one, I guess, in terms of digital fashion or the digital surroundings, you know, how do we culturally sort of read these spaces? Could we sort of, you know, uh, 
could we get uh, someone get offended or someone would you, you pose also these types of, of, of um, uh, problems where you sort of need to, to regulate these spaces to avoid these types of things happening when you are sort of together it's not just on your Instagram where it's a sort of a, a different type of communication so these things are going to uh, come with these types of social I'm going to come back to this, uh, this question a little bit later uh, because much of that space is for us to define and it seems exactly yeah, that exactly. either they're not defined yet or we are not actively defining themselves. Um, yeah. yeah, so building back to this sort of, um, the subject navigating the next, so you want it also to be attacked. And I'm just thinking, being very pensive here, thinking you should really trash your, your research, what you've done on this thing, because everybody is trying to, there's a lot of deja vu in a sense. So what is NFTs is what we had in music in the underground. Okay, underground becomes mainstream inevitably either because of quality or this commercial valuation. You know, you go to jazz concert, you don't only see people of very age. So that's what you talk about a lot. So there's a lot of this, as long as it's a, you know, it's, it's, and it's all based on Greek tragedies because even if you have, if you're a 12 year old kid haven't gone to school, I'm sure you've seen like, you know, Gladiators or whatever, like, you know, so, or, or the new stuff, Vikings, whatever. So it's, um, the, the fundamental cause is still there. A lot of this uh, deja vu effects, uh, but what we have is, for obviously for somebody who hasn't encountered that, is something like, that completely bewildering. And like Estonia, we, we all come from a countries where there are ministries of culture, okay? In the United States of America, it does not have a ministry of culture, but yet this produces amazing culture in a way. So I think in a sense, it's like, I wouldn't even worry about that. I mean, like, you know, Estonia we should have like 10 ministries of cultures. They're called DAOs. And I think that's the thing, because the, the two things that are needed is, one is, is uh, as I said, you know, the, the, the funding, which is inevitable because we are physical beings, you know, in digital world we need as well. And then it's a recognition. But historically, if you go back, it wasn't like the production comes. It was there was something called art critique. And this is, uh, or uh, in film critique, which were more, far more powerful, the theatre, etc., literature. So I think we should just basically study, you know, what the institutions worked back then and see how you can then sort of transfer to the the world where people find them they're more sort of acceptable. So I think the sense of running around and hair is chicken and saying, oh, this is all damn new, is yes, there are aspects that are absolutely new. But as I said, our cognitive sort of capabilities have not changed. So it's that's uh, instead of like trying to put it through sort of like, you know, the, the old stuff in a sense. So we have to understand that the, that the, um, no, the, the, the time seven, etc. that a lot of the institutional stuff has really changed over the last of years. But if you go back to 60s, 70s and 80s, it was interesting with the cinema. So we decided what we're going to show to the kids, you know, um, so the, to our audience, like, you know, uh, for the anniversary, you know, we show them James Dean, you know, I mean, Pulp Fiction has been 30 years old. And for them, and, and you can see that they react exactly the same way. So I think the best way to stay kind of normal and actually is to cultivate yourself and traverse through this sort of like, you know, horizontal layers. And then basically, you know, it all comes down. If you want to be a cultured person, you know, get yourself exposed to all kinds of uh, culture. You do not want to be monocultural. We see the monocultural now like, you know, 150 kilometers away from here. And that's, you know, not the model that we want to, want to really live in. So I think, uh, we shouldn't be too worried about stuff, but you know, our parents have done this before us. So uh, I think going back uh, sometimes needed in order to go really fast forward. Question, uh, Irvin. Uh, we have a question from audience. Art and NFTs Web3. Could you explain with two sentences how an artist should plan to launch at Web3? That's a, that's a tough challenge. Oh, Get in touch with the gallery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um. yeah. We have two galleries yeah, here. Yeah, Problem solved. <laughs> uh, how many sentences was it again? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, I think they should think about the stuff that they have put aside in the past because they didn't have budget or space or materials. Because for me, it was a lot like that. That sort of like some bigger visions in the past were able to be realized in the digital format because of the lack of constraints. Um, and then I would strongly um, suggest that you don't use traditional media, but you work in the digital sphere from the beginning to the end. That uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, people who paint or draw and then they photograph the work and then sell NFTs of these pictures, but it defeats the whole point of uh, making 
digital art. Yeah. That's it. Mm. How big of a tech barrier there is for, a, let's say, um, traditionally trained artists to get in, in this space? Because you have to deal mm. with drops, Discord communities, platforms, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, it depends on how big of an operation you want to run. You can, you can do it in an afternoon. You can use Microsoft Paint to make a JPEG if you want to. <laughs> and then, a photo in NFT if you want to. Yeah, yeah you could use the photo, yeah, or for your phone. Um, well, you know, there's many art worlds. In there, there's many conversations. There's many dialogues. Uh, and it all depends on which conversation you want to be a part of. So you should probably look at the people who are trailblazing uh, and contributing in the most cutting edge way in that scene that you want to be a part of, and then uh, take cues from there, apply your own principles, and uh, yeah, give it your best shot with your own, t own flavor. You know, but the blockchain stuff I wouldn't be scared of. It's only if you want to really program your NFT. Sure, you have a blockchain there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I, w I wouldn't worry about it. The, the barrier to entry for individual uh, is not not too bad at all if you don't want to, re if, you, if, you, if we uh, set aside Ethereum for a moment. Because Ethereum is so expensive, but if you go to other chains, it's, it costs next to nothing. Um, it happens pretty much instantaneously and uh, you're the one in charge constantly. You don't need to interact with a middleman except when you first get some coins from, a, from an exchange or ask a, a friend of yours to send a coin over. So you can, we, I, I like it because you can proceed with your own pace. That it, it's, it's quite independent as a working method, but if you do the Discord drop method and you, you want to promote it, create some kind of interest around it, then we are entering the territory where you realize, hey, that gallerist idea, that isn't so silly after all. Maybe I don't want to promote myself, document everything myself, talk to the collectors, talk to the curators. You know, that's, that's the sort of professional level that the, the gallery adds. And I'm quite sure that all NFT artists will, um, not all, but all NFT artists that are meaningfully contributing to the uh, to the fine art corners of the space right now will at one point or another be uh, absorbed into the existing gallery system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? We can try to throw the ball. This is the part that I have yeah. to throw. Yeah. Just throw it to see catch it. <laughs> Somebody. Peter always wants to ask questions. Yes, you have to. Oh. Ah. Here we go. <laughs> ah. Okay, so uh, what's the coolest project uh, in your space right now? That was actually my, going to be my last question. <laughs> is that going to be like a <laughs> So <laughs> I'll, I All can right. start. I'm, I'm repping some Aave merch. Uh, it's a DeFi protocol I, I love and use, but it's actually their community grant spin-off called Aave Gochi, which has their 8-bit metaverse, and I'm very happy to pet my gotchis every day. I think that's the <laughs> nicest uh, format of uh, metaverse interaction that I, I'm aware of right now. It's, it's nice because it's very low threshold and it's all on chain, so it's using the strengths of the ecosystem while acknowledging the limitations of it, which is right now, it's like 8-bit graphics. Uh, yeah, actually works instead of empty promises. Cool. Can everybody, everybody answer? I think this is a really good question. So yeah. Actually, mine is different. So, I, uh, so um, uh, I always move away when I think I, I see the path already. But it's actually a uh, virtual production studio, so I, I can promote one of my companies, Digital Sputnik, which is behind over 100 best films and recently come out, and the was behind The Mandalorian, where everything cost and Star Wars was... Uh, Millions. I can't say, say say exactly how much it was, but it was in, into millions. And we were like, hmm, that's like you know, great. But we actually realized, and that's like total rebel, that we can bring that uh, and look down to literally tens of thousands, potentially to a few thousand, which is the cost of a proper like an SLR camera, because that's in, that's the last question you said like you know, what's a technological barrier? Because yes, there is. I mean, you more money you have, more stuff you can do. And a film, particularly, is like you know, this is sort of a, you know, you don't have it on green room stuff, but but uh, this is going to be one of the main formats already. And we know from internet traffic yes. is that moving images is number one. 
and making virtual production accessible, basically having a live picture behind you and not having to like have to look like you are an amateur, but you can really be like, you know, in a real setting, bringing that to the people. I think that is something that we'd really like to, and I think that is the last barrier for the, uh, at least in moving images of film, uh, for uh, for bringing down the power of uh, of the, uh, the, the the studios, which uh, needs to be done because we've done distribution, and we've done everything else, but still the means of production, what Karl Marx said, the means of production should be handed back to the people, <laughs> and that's what we really need to do. Xenia. Uh, I have been wondering for a long, long time already. Like I have been professional designer since 2002, so I have done so many designs for other companies and, and so on. And, you know, in the music industry, this is what happens, that all the creators get, get value uh, later on as well, even if they, like, did the song, wrote the song some 20, 50 years ago. So it's not what's happening with the designers. So once you gave away your style, your design, that's it, you're done. And somehow it is unfair, guys. So, you know, if I... If, we, if there would be such a system, uh, that would be a lot, a lot for a lot of designers in the world. So lately I have been thinking that now there is some movements towards uh, actually really going this way that designers could have through NFT. Uh, sold this for themselves. Mm. So I've... I have been thinking a bit moving towards those thoughts and me myself would really gain from that and I believe that a lot of colleagues of mine as well so that would be great. Dirk. Yeah, it's interesting how the same technologies are being applied rather differently by different uh, cultural industries. So um, I'm mostly thinking about film and, and television stuff and, uh, and um, so they uh, the university where I work uh, in, we have had 10 years a uh, study program called Transmedia Production or Crossmedia Production. Yeah? It's all about uh, yet that you not only produce a film, but you, you create a story world and you, then you create animation, uh, video games, all kinds of comic books, etc. etc. So, because you already created the kind of intellectual assets, so you can expand and expand and include the community. But the industry has always struggled to how to really make that participation, community integration real. Uh, if you think about when Disney bought uh, Lucasfilm, the, that moment they disregarded all the fan lit, the fans that had been, had been created and turned this into somehow, somehow inofficial stuff. Yeah? But now what, I'm, uh, what I find very, very interesting in, in the blockchain area or NFT context is not NFT is not really as art art, mm -hmm. but art as but these NFTs as kind of identity presentation. So I wouldn't disregard these profile pictures, etc., as a bad thing because it's all, in some sense, it's all about of showing off your identity, yeah. the community mm. you belong in, and um, and then also they work as tickets. They also work simply as investments, investments into that story world, into that community, and increasingly the most fascinating projects that you asked. Is, is these really attempts of, of, of trying to create these um, uh, communities of, of creation where the participants really are invested in. They, they perceive that this is their own, yeah? Mm -hmm. And they, they, they are part of it. They then they are really integrated. They participate in communal music creation or communal sub-story creation, etc., etc. So this is what we really should now uh, teach in our university in terms of how to how to manage this transmitter project and Tali Grafen and community community management project. They create DAOs, yeah, decentralized and autonomous mm -hmm. organization, etc. Really, really fascinating stuff happening in this area. Yeah, and so, you know, historically, if in any creative industry, pretty much the audience. Has has been always on the very last step, yeah. whose, uh, whose opinion prior Netflix rarely is regarded, then now everything is going towards community first, where you have to create some meaning and then make your decisions <coughs> and directions afterward. Hovat. No, I, I kind of touching upon the same thing. I think it's, it's going to be extremely interesting to see now the, the communities that will 
come out from both uh, sort of the the, the um, infrastructure when that comes in place with sort of high speed uh, internet being able to actually have the infrastructure even if your your uh, phone or your your device is not the strongest and being being able to sort of up the f fidelity that coupled with with uh, now seeing artificial intelligence really booming in terms of self expression you know there's there's really sort of a new field opening up uh, through prompt based uh, um, algorithms where you can use text in order to guide uh, artificial intelligence to produce images or video and really seeing a new sort of uh, boom there and see how, how are people going to, given these tools, how are people going to express themselves, what is going to come out of it and that when that comes together with these social spaces I think that's going to be extremely interesting. Um, Yes. yes. All right. We're perfectly on time. <laughs> Thank you so much for the conversation, Howard, Indrek, Xenia, Indrek, and Erwin. Thanks for staying us for this discussion. Please talk to the gallerists, the artists, the fashion designers, um, and researchers. Hopefully, we'll have some post conversations as well. Thank you very much for joining us today and live, and thank you for Northern for putting this together. See and you thanks next to the audience and the patients. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.